Well, I do want to pray for us this morning. I know I need it. Um, I haven't spoken for 30 minutes without stopping for two weeks. And um, I had COVID, low symptoms, but I still had it, right? And there's still a, an effect on my lungs and on my breathing and on my coughing. And so um, I just appreciate your prayers even for me. I do have water here. So if I start coughing, you don't have to run up here with water. Um, but I need the Lord's strength. And we all do, right? We are foolish to think we can live this life without him. Jesus warned us, saying, apart from him, we can do what? Nothing. <laughs> Even this morning's service, you know, ushering in our new worship director, Adam Ayers, which, by the way, if you didn't know, today was his first Sunday leading us in worship as a staff member of Hillside. So, Adam, welcome to the family. Um, but this family that we have here, the Hillside family, is one that is deep, um, and we want to hopefully you feel that even this morning. Um, but I, as, your, as your pastor, I need to let you know that everything's not just going to go okay. <laughs> um, there's a song, uh, Quarantine Life by Matthew West, and it's, uh, it's not all good, but it's all all right, is one of his lyrics in there. And um, God doesn't promise to take us out of struggle. He promises us to be with us through the struggle. God doesn't promise to take us out of pain and suffering. He promises to be alongside us in the midst of the trials. And so whatever you're going through tonight or this morning, this Christmas season, don't, you don't need to put on a happy, smiley face because it's Christmas time. God doesn't need you to fake it for him. A couple of years ago, we actually did a series called God With Us? Question mark Because a lot of people just feel like, is he really? And this morning, I want to talk about hope because the world needs it. Without God, you are hopeless. Maybe with God, you have trouble even holding on to hope. And so this morning, I pray that we grow in our ability to have hope because of who God is and what he's called us to be. Um, but to that end, I don't want this to just be a speech that you listen to. It's something that we need in our life and that we need to use for the days to come. Because this is real stuff. God talked in his Bible about real life. <laughs> Not just some fairy tale movie, you know? So let's pray. And let's hear from the word of the Lord this morning. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to be here in your church. We were online worshiping through Facebook, and many people are doing that even today, God. And we're just thankful that the church be, is beyond these walls. But there's something about just seeing people, shaking hands, and being in the room with our family again. And so I pray that you would help those that can't be here this morning, Lord. Help them to feel the love of your people. Help them to feel the love of your spirit because you are with them too. God, here this morning, allow for us not to be going through the motions or distracted. Lord, may we truly hear from your spirit this morning. God, we want to be changed because your way is best. And I know speaking for myself, I have a lot to learn. I have a lot of room to grow. I'm not done being changed into the likeness of your son yet. So Lord, shape me, use me to shape each of us this morning. But God, I just sense that today maybe there are people in the hearing of my voice that are just struggling to have hope. And I ask, Lord, that your spirit would give them reason to have hope again, would give them reason to cling on to who you are as our Savior and our Lord. God, I hold this envelope in my hand as a reminder, Lord, we pray right now for Bill Webb, who when I heard last was um, just not doing well. Um, he was in ICU and just struggling to live, and he's one of our family members, and I pray that you would strengthen his body and give comfort to their family. Also in this time, think about the Selig family who lost a dear mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, Nettie this year, this last week, 101 years old. God, what a celebration of life, but death and pain is part of this struggle of world. So God, I pray that you would comfort Dwayne and Trudy, even this morning, their family. Lord, may we realize that we do not grieve as the world grieves, without hope. God, we don't go through life struggles as the world goes through them without hope, or we're not supposed to. 
So God, I ask that this morning that your spirit would renew in us hope, that we would recommit ourselves to live as people of hope, all for your glory and for our good. So in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, this morning we're going to continue in the series on uh, renewal, and I want to just read over you our vision. I want to do this every week so you understand kind of where it is and what we're doing here. Um, the, these are words that are underlined and bolded are the words that we're going to aim our sermons for the next uh, three weeks as we go through Advent here. And last week, again, Dan Goody did a great job of introducing this idea of renewal, a spiritual renewal, really the emphasis, right? So we as a church want to renew our commitment to share the good news by, number one, recommitting personally to God's calling on our lives. We'll talk about that even this morning. We also want to reaffirm the work that God has and is doing. This is not a new thing. We don't need God to show up because he hasn't been here before, but he already has, and he's going to keep working because God is faithful. And thirdly, we want to renovate the building that God has given us with, that he's blessed us with. Notice all these things, recommitment, reaffirmation, remodeling, so that the Spirit of God can bring revival to our community. This is hillside specific. This is family specific. But it's also Crown Point. It's also Northwest Indiana. It's also wherever our Facebook stream reaches to Africa, to to people that are in the Philippines. We're praying for Pastor Kenneth who's recovering from COVID as well. Our community is small and big, right? That we want to see God bringing revival to. So this is what the vision is. There are elements that are building, but it is for the purpose of impact, for the purpose of life change. Well, this morning we're going to look at Acts chapter 4, if you want to turn there. And I want to look at recommit, this idea of recommitment. And um, this morning I want to look at what can we learn from Peter's recommitment. And we'll look at how Peter recommitted his life and how that went in Acts chapter 4. Um, If you don't mind standing with me, it's going to be a bit of a long reading. I'm going to read all of uh, 1 through 31. Um, I haven't been here for two weeks, so we've got to make up for some lost time. (laughs) Please stand with me in reverence for the Lord's reading of his word. Acts 4, 1 through 31 reads, And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were high of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, By what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? 
For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign was of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the high chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they had heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of your father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why do the Gentiles rage? And the people's plot in vain. The kings of earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now look, Lord. Look upon their hearts, their threats, and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. You may be seated. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. If you need your uh, fitness instructor to have proof of your workout today, I'll sign a sheet of paper for you, okay? <laughs> I struggled whether or not to have you stand for the reading of God's word there, but we do it because it's reverence, right? It's, we stand for the national anthem, we stand for the bride coming in, and we stand for what word is going to be preached. And so hopefully... You understand the reason why, not because we're jumping through a hoop, but because God's word is what has been read before us even this morning. I want us to look at a couple of passages of scripture, um, smaller chunks that are not really the aim of my sermon, but I want us to get context of Peter here. So I will read through these and click them, Jim, um, as we look back. In Luke chapter 22, Simon Peter, that's his name, Simon, who was later called Peter, is, uh, is confronted with... Um, by Jesus at the Lord's table, at the communion, remember? And look what Jesus says. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus knew that Simon would fail, would struggle, would fall, but not fail. And notice when he turned back, what's he supposed to do? Strengthen your brothers. Jesus saw both the struggle and what happened after the struggle before any of it happened. But look what Peter says in response to that prophecy. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me. <laughs> Three times that you know me. Peter had a great zeal for the Lord. He wanted to even die with him. And Jesus says, Peter, oh, you're going to say you don't even know me. Now put ourselves in the shoes of Peter here. This would be a really hard thing to swallow, a hard thing to understand. That I'm going to struggle with this. That, that I'm glad you prayed for me, Jesus, but you don't need to. I, I, I got this. <laughs> I'm never going to deny you. I love you. These would be the thoughts in Peter's mind, right? Well, not soon after that, in uh, Luke 22, moving forward, starting in verse 54, it says, and this is at the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is praying and the guards come, and we'll pause there real quick and just say, 
Peter did what he was going to do, right? He started cutting off the ear of the soldier, and he did that, and he was ready to protect his Lord. And what did Jesus say? Put away the sword. One who lives by the sword dies by the sword, right? Like, hey, I'm okay. And Peter, the one that was bold and ready to stand up, sees his Savior offer himself freely and is stunned. Things didn't go as he expected them to go. Jesus didn't fight for his life like he would have thought he would fight for his life. And now he's confused. And in this posture of confusion, in this result of things not going as he expected, this is where the Peter that Jesus predicted would come out, comes out. In the boldness of our faith, we can do what we say we're going to do. But when things shift a little bit and we are thrown off by what God is doing, now what does our faith look like? When we, when we prayed for that spouse of ours or for our mother to get healed for cancer and God allows them to die and to go into heaven, now how is our faith? When things don't go as we would expect them to do, and Peter, who was ready to fight for the Lord, is told to put the sword away, and he's just left with himself in confusion. And look what happens to Peter in this state. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. He's curious what's going to happen to his Lord, and he follows him to where he's being tried. Then a servant girl... It's often thought maybe seven, eight years old. This girl who was below normal citizens because she was a slave, a servant, right? She approaches Peter, the bold man who was following Jesus, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him. She said, this man also was with him. And Peter to a little girl, but he denied it, saying, woman, remember this is a servant girl, woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Now, again, put ourselves in the shoes of Peter. I know this isn't Easter, but it's important for us to understand. Peter, the man who was willing to die with Jesus Christ, when things didn't go as he expected, when he was told to put the sword away, he goes and follows his Savior, and he denies Jesus to a servant girl and to a crowd, probably in fear that he too would be arrested. That is Peter. That's who... We read about in Acts 4, but there's some gap we need to fill in. And when the rooster crows, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Didn't need to say a word, did he? <laughs> I told you this would happen. I prayed for you. I wonder in that moment if Peter remembered the second part of what Jesus said about what would happen after he had come back. He's probably just filled with shame and regret. Woe is me. What have I done? <laughs> Feeling like you've lost it. And you remember that the Lord said before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Now, yes, I am going to turn this sermon to hope. But let's be honest. There are things in our life that we do that we regret that God has to get us up from. Maybe we weren't the father we always wanted to be. Maybe we weren't the mother we always wanted to be. Maybe we weren't good children to our parents. Maybe there are things in our life that we just mess up with. Why? Because we are human. We sin. We mess up. And Peter messed up big time. In his own eyes, he felt shame. Well, helping us get from there to Acts 4 without reading all the passages of Scripture, uh, Jesus dies in Luke 23. Um, Jesus is put in the grave, and in Luke 24, they find his tomb empty. So these are some major events that happen, okay? Jesus, who was their leader, is killed. And what those days look like from Friday to Sunday, we'll never truly understand the hopelessness that those disciples might have had, that their Messiah 
was dead. But that Sunday morning, we celebrate that the tomb was found empty as the women were there. And look at how Peter reengages when the news of the tomb is reported. Um, they remembered the words and returning from the tomb, the, the women, uh, they told these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with him who told these things to the apostles. Notice, but these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. The, the disciples that were following Jesus were doubting the reality that this actually happened. But the very next verse we see, but Peter. But Peter arose and he ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves and he went home marveling at what had happened. The disciples didn't believe, but Peter, the one that had doubted Christ, was hopeful that what the news had been told to him was true. And he goes and he finds it true and it makes his perspective change. But it doesn't stop there. If we continue in this gap, okay, uh, it says in Luke 24, verse 34, that the Lord is risen indeed and he's appeared to Simon. This would be important. Like, even the one who doubted him, he's appeared to him. Right? Like, it's, in other passages, it says, uh, go and tell the disciples and Peter. Right? Because it's like, he might feel like he's not part of the group, so make sure you include him. That one that denied me, make sure he knows as well. And they're celebrating that he has visited with these people. Uh, Jesus appears to the disciples in that room, and he walks through the walls, and Thomas isn't there, and Thomas doubts, and he comes back later in Luke 24 and John 20. And, um, and then Simon Peter, in the response to all those things, seeing them three times, he just says, I, I'm going to go fishing. Now, this sounds like a good hobby. It sounds like a good uh, stress relief. But I think it's more. Why would Simon saying he's going to go fishing mean more than just I need to go visit uh, to take some time off, because what was Simon's previous life? What was Simon's previous occupation? Fisherman. And I think Simon's like, hey, it's great that God's here, and, but I am not worthy to follow him anymore. I'm going to go fish again. And we see him just allowing himself to do what he used to do because he feels unworthy to do what Christ called him to do. And he goes fishing. And at the fishing time, he interacts with Jesus, almost a retelling of the first time that Jesus fell, found him. And he calls him again. And he's out there, and he's fishing, and, and the, Jesus tells him to fish on one side, and they catch all this fish. And Simon Peter is so excited, he puts on his cloak, jumps into the water, and swims to the Lord. Wow. What hope. <laughs> Jesus is here and he's talking to me and he goes and swims to him. And at that time, that's when Jesus asks him the three questions, do you love me? Three times, right? We know this from Easter. Why? Because it, it's the three times he denied him and he's forgiving him for his denial. And his response to that is, feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Right? He, he's in, instilling him back into ministry. He's giving him the call back to what I called you to do. Remember, you're not a fisherman. You're a fisher of men. Peter, don't forget. Recommit. And then Jesus ascends to heaven in Luke 24. And then we have uh, the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in Acts 2. That's also what happens before this Acts 4 telling. And in response to the Spirit coming, Peter is the one who preaches in the Spirit's power. In Acts 2, and God works a miracle. He offers healing to a man. He says, we don't have money, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus, walk to the man that's crippled in Acts 3. And this is what the people of Israel, the leaders of Israel, are mad about in Acts chapter 4. If you want to go back and read Acts 2, 3, and 4 this week, it might help you to get context of Peter's sermon. But I want you to see the change in Peter's life as he goes from the man who said, I'll honor you and I'll die with you, and then when he has a chance, he doesn't. In fact, he feels so remorsed about it, he leaves the, the group and goes fishing. But Christ forgives him. 
And he gives him the power of a spirit, and he becomes a bold preacher who saves thousands because God uses him. I would describe this... Uh, I'm going to skip ahead to the words real quick and come back to the passage. But I would describe this idea as recommitment. Um, here we go. Because Peter had to recommit his life, right? He had to recommit his time. He had to recommit his focus. He, he had to recommit everything because it had been lost as a commitment. Now, I want to pause real quick because I think Dan Goody, last week's pastor, did a really good job of saying maybe for some of you it's not a recommit, it's a commit. <laughs> maybe for some of you it's a start of something, not the renewal of something, and that's okay. But there is a reason that because of who Christ is and what he's done that we are wise to say, you know what, I'm going to do things a little differently because of what I've heard today. I'm going to do things a little differently because of what I read in the scriptures this morning. I'm going to do things a little differently because of what I was reminded by, by the Spirit of who I am in Christ. And we're going to recommit to be who God called us to be. Peter, in the midst of this storm of life, of failures, and coming back, remember Jesus said, but when you come back, you will strengthen the brothers. Why? Because he recommitted to be on mission. This vision for us to recommit is as a church to commit to who we are as a church, to connect people to God and each other, to make disciples who make disciples. But it's also for you individually to recommit to what God's called you to do, what God's called you to be. Maybe we need to recommit to, like I referenced this earlier, but being a godly father or a godly mother. Maybe our parenting has been one of those things that we've been doing, but not with a committedness that God wants us to do as Christian parents. There should be a difference, right? There's parents, and then there's parents who are saved and led by the Lord, and they should have difference in how they parent, difference in how they respond to children who need our guidance, respond to issues that come our way. But this should also affect us as children to our parents. Christian children are called to honor their parents. We're all called to, but not everybody who agrees with God's word. We're called to honor them and to love them and to care for them. We're called to be different in our workplace. We're called to be different in how we act on the sports field or towards our teachers in the classroom. These are things that we need to be committed to because they often don't happen by themselves. God has given you a calling. First calling is to live as his child, to live in the forgiveness of his son, to be a child of God, to be an ambassador for the kingdom is a commitment. But there are also other areas of our life that God has called us specifically to. I've been called to be a pastor of a church, and I need to be committed to that calling. What has the Lord called you to do? Are you committed? If so, celebrate and stay committed. If not, consider recommitting. Peter did it. You can do it. But there's hope for this because of three things that I see in this particular story and account of what we looked at today. First of all, we can have hope that we can recommit. We can have hope in life in general because we have a risen Lord. Think about how Peter's life changed when he realized that Christ was risen. How the hopelessness he had before Christ on Sunday morning was tomb found empty. How it had shifted in his life. Let me ask, is the fact that Christ is risen, is that creating hope in you? And does that stir in you a desire to recommit to him? We think about Christ being risen on Easter, and that's true. But without Christmas, there would be no Easter. True? Christ came to die. He came to die to, to live. He came to this earth to live the perfect life, to give the perfect sacrifice so that we would not have to pay for our sin. The purpose of Christmas is for his resurrection. 
It is connected because Christ came to do what we could not do. But we should find in us a building up of hope because our Savior, our Lord, is alive today. If it doesn't, then I'm going to ask you to be pursuing God that it can. Because God, as a Savior, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again, is a story that's not just something we find in the Bible. It changes everything. A lot of people worship gods that have passed on or died. You talk to a Buddhist, Buddha is, you can go visit his grave. People that are Muslim can go and visit the grave of Muhammad. Um, I, I don't know a grave that I can go visit where my, my Savior is. Do you? I, I, there's, no, there's no headstone for me to go and lay roses at for Jesus Christ. Because our Savior is alive. Never to die again. Jesus being alive should stir in us hope. I was thinking of an illustration to, to relate to this, and I couldn't think of one. And maybe that's a good thing. Because <laughs> there's no relation of the world that I can think of where anything could ever be this close to what stirs in hope. The people that follow Jesus, the New Testament is written after a, a silence period of many hundreds of years. And breaks out of that silence an angel speaking about the coming of a Savior and speaking to the shepherds on the hill about Jesus, the, the Lord Himself, God, has sent you a Son and He is found in a manger. And this is an incredible reality. And that Messiah being followed for 33 years of ministry is celebrated and appreciated and then killed. What do you do now? God, your, your plan seems not to be working. The one you promised that would save us from all this stuff is in a grave. But on Sunday morning, when God showed what he was doing, that death could no longer hold him, that sin would not win, that is when hope was born. That can never be silenced. Jesus being raised from the dead should provide in us hope. And that should stir us to recommitment. The second thing we should have hope in and that we can have hope in is because of our forgiving Savior. Think about it in Peter's life, the forgiveness that Jesus offered to him. Now we know 2,000 years later that we are forgiven because of the blood on the cross. But many of us need to hear the human voice say, I forgive you. Would you agree? There's something about the human relationship that when things are broken, we just need to hear that, I forgive you. We, we know that Christ has forgiven us. We know all things are paid. But are we forgiven in our relationships with people? And when Jesus spoke forgiveness over Peter, when the, he asked the question of, do you love me? And he reinstills him into ministry. I'm guessing that Peter had a new sense of hope because he felt forgiven in a way he had never felt before. Now, I don't think that he was forgiven his sins when Jesus asked him that question. I think he was forgiven his sins when the cross received the blood of Christ, right? When it was finished, Jesus said. But there was something about Peter receiving the forgiveness that day when he was with his Lord, hearing the questions of, do you love me, that we need to hear ourselves. Our sins have been forgiven 2,000 years ago, but do you feel forgiven this morning? Do you feel the forgiveness of your Lord or do you need to hear him say over you, while you were a sinner, I died for you. <laughs> that I love the whole world, that I would send my only son, that you wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. God wants to say he loves you and he forgives you. Now go and sin no more. If we have received Jesus as our Savior, if his blood has covered our sins, then we are forgiven. Live like you're forgiven. But on the flip side, if Jesus is just a person for somebody else and not been that for you, you are not yet forgiven. You need to be. 
the weight of what's coming for you in the future is too heavy of a burden for you to carry. You need the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Receive him. Receive his forgiveness even today. As long as I can remember, I've uh, eaten and breathed basketball since I could walk. Um, many kids would go to sleep care, uh, suggling their teddy bear. I went to sleep with the basketball. I would lay in my bed and just shoot the ball up in the air. And I, I don't know if it was spurred on by um, The Pistol. That was one of my favorite movies growing up about Pete Maravich. Pistol Pete Maravich. And, um, but I also loved watching Michael Jordan and the Kansas Jayhawks and all these things. And one thing that I loved to do... Uh, it was spurred on early in my life, probably by the Pistol movie, um, but even more so, I think I spent three hours reenacting this shot after, many of you will know this because we're up near Chicago, after Michael Jordan hit the game-winning shot on the Utah Jazz, slightly pushing Ron Harper out of the way, fading back and hitting the jumper. And many times I would three, two, one, and if I make it, then we win. And if I miss it, we went into overtime. It was never a, we lose. <laughs> Let's do that again. Three, two, one, overtime. All right. Um, but this uh, idea of us um, being the hero of our team, right, that we can make the game-winning shot, maybe... Uh, in other things in debate or in uh, speech class, it's that last rebuttal you gave that won the debate for your team. It doesn't have to be a sports thing, but we want to come on top. We want to be given an opportunity and succeed. And we reenact this as a young person all over in our life. And, but we know that not every shot goes in, right? <laughs> we remember the ones that go in. Did you know this last week, uh, LeBron James played in a basketball game and had two of these shots that he missed, and they went to overtime. And they ended up losing in triple overtime, I think, to the Indiana Pacers, because not every shot goes in. In fact, as a teacher and as a coach, I had to tell my students and my players, even the best basketball players, there are like 40%, and that's good. What does that mean? That they miss six out of ten shots. But we always remember the one that goes in. Even in baseball, if somebody's batting 300, think about that. That's one out of three times you get a hit and you're celebrated. That means you miss two out of three, right? We live in a world that expects us always to make the shot. But what happened to me in my life as I grew up around basketball, I had these dreams of making those shots. And there were times when I had the opportunity and I missed and I didn't want the ball anymore. Did that happen to you? Like, hey, uh, give it to somebody else. I, I can't do this. And what God is saying, and he said it to Peter, is I'm going to give you another chance. Believe in yourself. You put in the practice. Stop doubting yourself. You can make the shot. And when a coach has a player who misses the game-winning shot and they're their attitude and their belief in themselves are down. It's amazing how much a person will grow in confidence when they're given another chance. You're in a timeout. There's five seconds left. Hey, we're going to have Johnny shoot this one. But coach, I missed last time. Hey, you're going to make it this time. It's amazing when we're given another chance, how it instills in us to succeed and do it better. That's what forgiveness is, right? God says, I want to give you another chance. He said, I believe in you. Yeah, you messed up last time, but let's do it again. Forgiveness. Second chance. And church, I'm here to tell you that when God says he forgives you, you're going to mess up again. We're going to miss a couple shots. But we can't stop shooting. We can't stop trying. That's hopelessness. Hope is believing that God will be with us and help us to succeed. Not always winning, but doing what he wants us to do. 
sometimes in response to failure, like Peter did. Some Sunday I'll probably preach these as parallels, the failures of Peter and the failures of Judas, because I think they're actually very similar. What's different is how they respond to failure. If we wallow in the despair of who am I, and I'll never be able to do this, we start to devalue who we are in the Lord. We start to think that I'm a nobody. But if we remember who God has called us to be, we realize that God has given us the strength to try again. The strength to not give up. The strength to feel forgiven because Jesus says, I forgive you. What hope we have in a forgiving Savior. Finally, we can have hope because of the power of the Holy Spirit. This is something that I don't think we truly understand. In fact, I'm going to do in the month of January, February, a study on the Holy Spirit for us to learn about it more. But it's hard for us to imagine life as a disciple for the resurrected Lord reality without the Holy Spirit. Because they're only 50 days, right? Like, even less with the time of how he was raised. But 50 days from um, the Passover to Pentecost. And there's this time of like, all right, risen Lord, but no Holy Spirit yet. We don't know what that looks like. What does a believer look like when they believe in a risen Lord, but don't have the power of the Spirit? We'll never understand. But I think because of what the believers felt in those 50 days, they realized the power of the Holy Spirit. Because they lived as believers. They lived as we believe in a risen Lord, and they didn't have the Spirit yet. And when the Spirit came, there was an additional power that we don't really understand because when we believe Jesus is Lord, we receive the Holy Spirit together, don't we? Now, how much of what you feel for God is because of you believing in Jesus is risen? We don't know. How much of it is just the Holy Spirit within you? We don't know. It's both. They are together. But we must remember that the Holy Spirit within us should give us hope. There is power that we have because of God dwelling with us. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you, and he sends his spirit. God is with you. God can give you the words that you need to say in a situation where you're willing and ready to be used by him. God can grow in you fruits of the spirit so that who I am today is not who I'll be in a year because I have more peace in my life and I have more love for other people. Why? Because God is working in me. I pray that you have hope because you see the Spirit working in you. I pray that you have hope realizing that if God is for us, who can be against us? The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you. We can't live hopeless lives in the midst of the power of the Holy Spirit. We sometimes do, but it shouldn't be. We sometimes do, and I'm not here to say shame on you. I'm saying, ask God to help you to get over that. Because it's not as God wants it to be. We can quench the Spirit. We can deny its impact in our life because we're in the way. And just say, God, I'm getting out of the way. I'm recommitting to be shaped by your Spirit. I'm being recommitted to be shaped by you in whatever way you want me to do. That's hopeful. Because why? Because I believe God can work in our lives when we're available to be shaped. I love all forms of water, preferably moving, though lakes are good too. But if, if I'm hiking anywhere, I'm looking for where the creek is, where the waterfall is. I like going to the ocean. I love water. I like snow. I've been praying for it, so if you have to shovel your yards later, you can blame me, Okay. I'm wanting a white Christmas. <laughs> but these things uh, were stirred up in me early. In fact, we went to Colorado every two years on a family reunion. I think I talked about this before, but one of our favorite things to do was to hike up and to see Alberta Falls. This is in the Rocky Mountain National Park. There, those are people up there in the top right, and so it's a very large um, waterfall that you can get really close to. You can actually feel the mist of this waterfall. And what I'm amazed about by waterfalls is the power of them. 
I had the opportunity as a kid to go to Niagara Falls. And that one is powerful, but it's also big. Like, you look at the river coming down and the gravity, and of course there's a powerful waterfall because look how much water there is. But when you find a small waterfall in the mountains where this little trickle of a creek becomes this powerful waterfall, it's, it's amazing to see the power that comes. And I've never seen a beaver try to build a dam on a waterfall of you. I mean, they'll do it like in a little gully somewhere where the water's kind of slowing down, but there's power that's unattainable. You can't contain it. But church, I wish we would realize the power that we have in the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the gates of hell cannot withstand the church. The Bible says to tell the devil to flee and he'll flee. And I've said this before, but it's worth saying again. We often feel like Alamo, the defense, just hold on a little longer until Jesus comes. No, we're on the offense. Evil is on the defense. We're called to push back the darkness, remember? Let's recommit to that. Because there is power. Because of what God is doing in us. And a river that comes to a waterfall can't decide to slow down. It is by nature going to increase in speed because it narrows and the gravity changes. And it's what God has allowed that water to touch, to do, that brings the power, right? The water can't feel, I need to become more powerful. No, it just does. As the church, we need to remember, we don't need to stir up in ourselves something that's not already there. We just need to let God do His work. The problem in my life, maybe even in yours, is how often I've tried to shape my life for the Lord. When God just says, just put yourself in my hands. I'm the molder, you're the clay, remember? <laughs> how often is clay are we trying to shape ourselves? And God just says, just if you let me work in your life, watch out. Watch what I can do. I want to recommit to that because I have hope that God is going to do incredible things in my life and that he's going to do incredible things in your lives and as a whole we're going to as a church have incredible testimonies of God shaping us more into what he wants us to be for his glory and for our good. But hope is different than a wish, remember? People can wish for things all they want. I, I wish that I made more money. I wish that I wasn't sick with COVID. I wish that's like the lottery. <laughs> Hope. Hope is trusting the Lord while you wait for what you expect to happen to happen in His timing and in His way. Jesus said that He would be with us. If you don't feel Him with you, then hope. Because you know he will be. If you don't feel God changing your life for his glory, then ask him to work in your life and hope that he will because you know he will be expecting the future while you wait patiently for his timing. But like Peter, we can come to things with a mindset of this is how you have to work, God. I'm going to do things the way I think you trained me to do it. And when he does things different, we cannot respond in pushing God away. Like this river, we have to be able to be bent and moved wherever he wants to take us. Because that is the path that we need to be on. It's the path that has the most power. So this morning, I pray that you would recommit your life to the Lord, recommit your marriage to the Lord, recommit your time and your energy to the Lord because He wants to use you. Shame on the churches that I've grown up in and maybe ourselves even too, that we give all God's work to the pastor and the paid staff. It is my job not to do church for you, but to equip you to do church in the world. How much more of an impact will we have in our community if the 50, 70, 100 people that are hearing my voice go and do what they need to do for the Lord than if I just go and roll up my sleeves and work for God? No, we need to stir each other on to good works that will be predestined before us to do, right? 
I hope that we can hear testimonies in the weeks to come of what you've recommitted yourself to do and how God has shown up and helped you accomplish those commitments. Let us pray. Lord God, we do come. We do worship. We do say, Lord, that we have messed up. But we also say thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for not giving up on your mission to save us from our sins. Thank you for being raised again, for forgiving us and for giving us your Holy Spirit. God, may we live lives full of hope. May we be committed to trust you in the midst of struggle. May we be committed to respond in gratitude and humility in the midst of success and blessing. But God, this life is an up and down journey and we need your help to stay focused, to stay committed. So thank you for instilling in us even this morning hope. And may we live our lives in a way that brings you ultimate glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please stand for worship.